you are going to get the background information for our Holocaust unit that you are going to need for the rest of the quarter doing our project that I haven't yet introduced to you but I've talked a little bit about and I'll introduce that to you later this week. But in order to have the background information to start this unit, um, I need to share a lot of information with you. So every year, uh, beginning of fourth quarter, we do this unit and I take usually one to three, I mean, I'd say two to three, usually it's on average two days of me actually, you know, standing up, talking, and lecturing for the whole class. It's the only time of the year that I do it, and the reason I do it is because it's very, very important for you to have this base knowledge, this background information, before we jump into this unit. The reason for that is the Holocaust, World War II, that era has so much information, so much rich stuff, things that happened, um, facts to know, places where you can go get all these things that I need to give you a general, and I say general, um, group of background knowledge so that you have a place to start. I don't touch on even close to, nor do we have time to touch on even close to everything that I'd love for you to know, but I pare it down to, I feel like, the base that you need in order to go out and find the rest of the information you need. So know that this is microscopic piece of background information for the whole Holocaust. But I feel like I give you a good base knowledge that if you need more information or want to seek that out, there's places for you to go and ways for you to find that. So we're all coming into this with some on the scale of some kind of knowledge of the Holocaust. Some of us know a lot about it. It's something that interests us. We've read about it before or researched it. Some of us know the word, know the person responsible, know vaguely what went on, but don't know that much. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do screen record me basically doing a pared down version of my lecture and my presentation that I would do if we were in the classroom together and know that I won't be able to get everything in this. Um, it's just not the same when you and I aren't interacting with each other. I usually have a lot of discussion with you. Um, I ask you questions. I have you chime in. I have you share your experiences or your thoughts. So just me having a one-sided conversation on a video screen um, it won't be as rich as it was, just know that, And but we are welcome to have those discussions at any other point. So I'm going to do my best to give you all the information I can, literally just going through this slide, um, and then we will, we'll work through what we can do with discussion and things later, but I want to give you the basis of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present. This will take over the screen. You'll be able to see what I'm doing. I will have to exit out, go to my next slide, kind of annoyingly, um, but I want you to have, one, this video, and then two, you're also going to have a copy of this document from class, Google Classroom. And if you'll notice down here on the document you have, instead of it saying click to add speaker notes, it's going to have all the extra stuff that's not on the slide that I'll say. So I will copy it down there for you. Um, usually I'd have you take notes while we're doing this, and there's actually like blanks within the slides. You'd see there's no blanks within these slides, obviously. Um, and that makes it a little more interactive, but I didn't want you to have to do that on Google or on the online for virtual learning. So I took those out. You have all the information in here, but there is a bunch of stuff I say that's not on that slide, and that's going to be the stuff that's down here on your own copy. You'll have your own copy from Google Classroom because you'll want to reference this again and again and again and again throughout the quarter because it's going to help us, one, do our project, two, um, reference things um, that connect to what we'll do later on. So I'm going to click present. It's going to take over your screen. And again, in your own copy, you'll have the extra stuff I say down here. Let's begin. So the word Holocaust, let's start with the word Holocaust, where it comes from, what it means. It's from the Hebrew lang language, the Jewish language, and it means when it's translated burnt sacrifice, like it says there. That's very morbid. That is sad. That is uh, emotional. It's a little bit gut-wrenching. And if you know, obviously, what's happened in the Holocaust, you know why that is the translation, why that's what it is called. Um, if you don't, I won't give that away yet because it's going to come later and it gets kind of sad. Um, and the symbol below that, I would ask you right now, does anybody know what that symbol is? It is a symbol, um, the Star of David, the symbol, the religious and cultural symbol of Judaism, being Jewish. Similar to, if I could find a, you know, a translation, um, like the cross for Christianity or Catholicism, etc. So it's the Star of David, the cultural and religious symbol for Judaism or being Jewish. Um, I also add to this slide 
the word stereotype. That's going to drive our fourth quarter. We're going to focus a lot on the Holocaust because it is an unprecedented piece of history that deals with stereotype and prejudice and discrimination. Um, but we are also going to transfer that knowledge to things that we know that have happened in history that weren't the Hol wasn't the Holocaust and things that we know that can connect to today and prejudice and stereotype and discrimination. Unfortunately, as humans, our history is full of that. It's full of negative things like that. There are also things that we could connect it to more modern. So in order to not repeat history, we have to understand history. That is why we learn about sad things like the Holocaust and things like that. So let's move to our next slide. The person responsible. There's a lot of people responsible for the Holocaust, but one person very much responsible would be Adolf Hitler. And at this point I ask you, have you heard of his name? Most of us would raise our hand and say yes. At this point, um, I would also let you know that before we talk a lot, I'm going to jump. So I'm going to jump. I'm going to tell you a little bit more present time. And then I'm going to jump back. We're going to talk about Adolf Hitler growing up, his past, uh, his family, what he went through to understand who he was. So we know his name does not mean anything good. We know he was the one responsible um, for millions of lives lost. But first, we're going to talk about kind of how, how the heck does somebody do that? How can somebody achieve mass murder on that big of a scale? So it seems incredible in a, in a way that seems almost unbelievable. And we'll talk about why that is. So first things first, I'm going to give you some myths. And a myth is something that's not true, but people believe it. So there are a lot of myths about why he did what he did why he murdered millions of people and how he pulled that off. Um, we don't know to this day. Historians and experts do not know one specific or one exact reason or him saying one reason why he did what he did. Uh, but there's a lot of myths out there. So there's a lot of reasons people think he did what he did. And we can assume and we can infer knowing what we know about him and knowing what happened and why he did what he did. But there are some myths that I want you to know are not true that you might hear. Um, so myth number one is that Germany knew exactly, or sorry, Germany didn't know what he would do. They were blind to it, or they didn't understand what he could pull off. Now, that reason that's a myth is because of this first thing. He wrote a book called Mein Kampf. Translated from German, that means my story or my struggle. And in this book, he wrote all about his plans to conquer the world, to get rid of a whole race of people, a whole religion, a whole culture and how he was going to do that. He talked all about it in his book. So the reason I give you that myth that Germany didn't know what he would do, that's a myth. He wrote about it in his book. It wasn't secret. He told all about it. He wrote in detail about what his plans were. So again, myth number one, Germany didn't know what he would do. That's wrong. Of course they knew. He wrote a book and published it. He wrote all about it. So let's go back to the kind of the beginning. So Germany comes out of World War I. They really wanted to conquer the world. That was their goal. They wanted to conquer the world, conquer Europe, and rule everything. Now, I would ask at this point, who knows what happened at the end of World War I? Somebody or a couple people would raise their hand and they would say, didn't they lose? And I would say, yes, they lost so badly. Um, after World War I, and they lost, they, Germany, they meaning Germany, um, had to, they had to do some reparations, which means they had to repair things. Not literal things, I mean, they did have to do that, but they, the rest of the world got together and said, well, we can't have them doing this again, so we're going to make some stipulations here. After they tried to conquer the world and failed horribly, the rest of the world said, first of all, you cannot have a military anymore. That's what we say. No more military for you. Then they said that they had to pay reparations, which means repair. Um, they had to pay other countries that they damaged. Obviously, a war does that. Um, they had to pay other countries for their damages, basically. And they were obviously in huge debt. The rest of the world also is in the Great Depression after World War I. Everybody's doing awful. They don't have any money to rebuild. They don't have anything. No one has jobs. It's not great. It's the 1930s. So they start a war. They lose a war. It's not a great time to be honestly anybody in the world. It's a tough time. It's why it's called the Great Depression. But it's really bad in Germany. Um, and so they, he starts to feel this hatred for anything or anyone not German. And that is why he, that's one of the reasons as to why he might have done what he did. Um, so he decides that he is going to be the one to help Germany 
take over the world again. There's a way to do it, he says. And the first thing is, the Jews, the Jewish people, they're the cause of all of our problems. He says, look around. Who are the people that have money? Jewish people. Who are the people that have businesses? Jewish people. They have banks. They have shops. They're doing well. Why are they doing well when the rest of us aren't? So he started to weave this web of lies that the Jewish people were the reason for all of Germany's problems. So let's jump to our next slide. Okay, so he starts to speak about, and he starts, it's, this is another reason why the myth of Germany not knowing what he was going to do is a lie, because he spoke all about it. He wrote about it in his book, and he would tell about it to anybody who would listen. So he starts to believe, really believe, and share with people that Jewish people were inferior, and they were, had no right to live with the superior Germans or Aryans. At this point, I would pause and say, who knows what Aryan means? This word right here. And someone would raise their hand. And they would say, oh, isn't that like how you, somebody looks? Yes. So we have heard that, that uh, we've heard someone say it before, we've read it before, that um, Germans or Aryans, this super race that he had create not created, but decided was superior, were Aryans. They're blonde hair, blue eyes, they're tall, they're athletic, and they were smart. So there was a specific super race, this superior German race that he felt uh, needed to rule the world, in addition to just German people in general. Um, so he also talked about how he didn't hate Jews for their religion, because that is called anti-Semitism, and he was smart enough to know that that had existed in the world before, that Jewish people have been persecuted from the beginning of time. Uh, he knew that that was not the way to go. So he said, we don't, we don't like them for their culture. There's a reason we don't like them. It's not because of their religion. That's anti-Semitism. It is because of their culture. So he was smart. He knew ways to do this. He knew ways to get to people, and he was very, very persuasive. But he did keep sharing that if we got rid of all the Jewish people, every problem would be solved. And he would say, get rid of. He wouldn't say something like murder. He wouldn't say something like kill. He would say, get rid of. If we got rid of them, that would be the solution to all of our problems. Another thing I would pause and stop and say at this point is, what is ironic about Hitler wanting to create this super race, the Aryans, the light hair, light eyes, tall, athletic, strong, smart? What's ironic about that? And somebody would raise their hand and say, because they've seen a picture of him, isn't that the opposite of what he looks like? And that is very, very true. He was not super tall. I think he was just a teeny bit shorter than I am, and I'm a taller person, but he wasn't super tall for a male. He had brown hair. He had dark eyes. And he wasn't, he was smart, so he had that going for him. He's very intelligent. That's why he was able to do all of this. But he did not look like or seem like this super superior race that he talked about, the Aryans. And something very interesting is that he vowed never to have children. He would never continue his bloodline because it wasn't in line with his, with his idea of this perfect superior race. So that's kind of an ironic, interesting thing. Um, and I want you to remember, one, this idea of anti-Semitism, that is the hatred of Jews, their religion. And remember that he did not say that. He said, we hate them because of their culture. Another thing to remember, I want you to remember this, is he was very, very smart. He was very manipulative. He was very persuasive. He was a great public speaker, and he was smart. So remember that. Okay, next slide. So we're jumping back now. You have a little bit of why he did what he did a little bit and a little bit of how he got there. So let's start from the beginning. All right. We have to understand who he was to try to figure out why he did what he did. So we have to try to understand him, even though that seems preposterous, this mass murderer, this genius, this crazy person. But let's start to learn about him a little bit. So he was born in Austria in 1889. If you know where Austria is, and this is when I would ask, it is not in Germany. He was not born German. He was not born in Germany, so remember that for later. Um, as, he, as a child, he was never close to his father, but he really, really, really loved his mother. So he had a good relationship with his mother, not his father. So a myth number two, people still say this and believe it to this day that haven't studied this topic before or aren't aware of it. A lot of people believe, and I think I heard someone say it earlier this year, and that's okay because we hadn't learned about it yet. Um, myth number two is that he hated Jews and he did what he did because his dad was a Jew and he didn't have a good relationship with him. 
not true. He, um, we still don't know again why he chose to hate Jews, but his dad was not Jewish. His mom was not Jewish. That is not a reason. That's not a valid reason as to why he did what he did. He, again, he didn't like his dad. His dad didn't like him, but that is not the reason he did what he did. His dad was not Jewish. People do believe that to today. So if you hear him say that, just say, no, nope, that's actually a myth. Um, so didn't like his dad. His dad didn't like him. He thought he was weak and his dad died in 1903. So if we do the math there, he was about 14 years old when his dad died. Okay. He wasn't super sad about that. They didn't have a good relationship. Uh, they had a really, really, really dysfunctional family, never close to dad. Dad was mean. Mom babied him. So not very good relationships. And then when his mom died, he was about 18. His life totally changed. Didn't have a good relationship with his dad. He had siblings, younger siblings. And then his dad dies. He's not super sad about it, but he probably feels pretty bad about that. Then his mom dies four years later from an aneurysm, I believe. Or no, from cancer. And he is now head of the household. He's got to take care of people. He has no money. He doesn't have a job. So myth number three is that when his mother was dying of cancer, uh, the doctors that couldn't save her were Jewish. Again, I said this is a myth. And people believe that that is a reason that he did what he did and hates Jewish people and wanted to get rid of them, exterminate them. Uh, that is a myth because she was seen by many doctors. Cancer in the 1930s was very, very hard to treat like it is today. We know people die of it still. It's easier to treat, but um, still a deadly disease. And he, she saw many doctors. Some were Jewish, some were not. Obviously, none of them were able to save her. So again, myth number three, he did what he did because the doctors that couldn't save his mother were Jewish. Not true. So another myth. All right, let's jump to our next slide. A little bit about him. Let's go on a little bit more. All right, so as a student, he was a genius. He was very smart, but he didn't really like school. He didn't have a good time. He didn't have a lot of friends. It was hard. Um, Dad picked on him, remember? And he didn't really like to focus on it. He wasn't, he was intelligent, but he didn't ever find school as a success for him. He had difficulty keeping up, and so he retreated into the world of art. He actually really wanted to be an artist. He was a good artist. Um, he really, really wanted that to be his thing. So after his mother's death, remember, he's about 18 years old, he goes to Vienna, which is in Austria, again, not Germany, to follow his dream to go to the Academy of Fine Arts and become a professional artist. He was a good artist, but he wasn't a good enough artist to get into the Academy of Fine Arts there. So myth number four, another myth. People think this is true. You have to submit something to get into the Academy of Fine Arts, obviously, your portfolio, and there are a certain number of judges on the review board to let you in. And the myth is that those people that were on that board were all Jewish, and they rejected him to art school, and that is why he did what he did. That is a myth because there were seven people on that board to let him in, I believe. Some were Jewish, some were not. Whether they were Jewish or not, the majority did not vote him in. And in fact, three of the people on that board were Jewish, and two of those Jewish people voted yes for him to enroll and to be admitted. But the rest on the board obviously did not. So that is a myth because that is not a reason why he did what he did. He didn't do what he did and exterminate almost an entire group of people because they didn't let him into art school. But again, another myth that people still believe to this day. Okay, so he doesn't get into the academy. He was rejected. He's feeling this rejection. He had found... Um, success when he was in the army for World War I. He was actually in the army for World War I. And that was something that he was actually really good at. So he couldn't get into art school. That was his other thing that he was really good at and really liked. So now he's got these two things that he basically failed at, that he actually really enjoyed. And he doesn't have anything, you know, to lead his life or to be successful at. So the next few years were spent roaming around Vienna and Austria. And he, you know, he had this artistic ability. So he becomes a house painter. During this time, doing these little jobs here and there, meeting people, wandering around, talking to people here, talking to people there, he starts to talk about and exhibit this hatred for Jewish people. Again, going back to that myth number one, that nobody knew what he was going to do, that's a myth. He talked about it all the time. He wrote about it in his book. He published it. It was public knowledge. Um, so he starts really publicly starting to talk about why he does and why everybody else around him should hate the Jewish people. Okay, next slide. 
Hopefully this can go a little faster than I think. Let's zoom. All right. So in 1913, <clears throat> he moves to Munich, which is Germany, to avoid having to serve in the Austrian army. So remember, he's from Austria. Um, he does not want to serve his country. He wants to move to Germany for whatever reason, and he wants to be German. So he becomes a draft dodger. There's a draft at this time where everyone, every male, a certain age, from a, an age range about 18 to something, have to join the army. That's why it's called a draft. He's a draft dodger, which is illegal. So he leaves his country, goes to another. And once he's in Munich, this ironic part of this, when World War I breaks out, he voluntarily joins the German army. So he's dodged his draft from his home country, Austria, sneaks over to Germany, and voluntarily enlists. Now this, again, like I told you in the beginning of this, was when he uh, started to feel that success, when he was in this army for, um, sorry, the German, the World War I in the German army. Um, so he voluntarily enlists. He's really successful. He'd found his calling. He loved this. He loved the camaraderie. He loved uh, having people to take care of, people to take care of him. He's actually distinguished himself in battle, and he's awarded the Iron Cross First Class from the German army. So again, he finds a success, finally. Couldn't be an artist. Uh, finds success in the army. And then, of course, like I told you before, his glory and his mi dreams of military glory were shattered when Germany lost so, so terribly. Again, not feeling great about himself. So... The world's punishment, again, remember, for Germany after World War I, after they lost, after trying to take over the world, is that they couldn't have an army anymore. That's not great for him. He's already been rejected from art school. Now he can't do the other one thing he's good at. So let's move to our next slide. We're cruising. Okay. So, after World War I, how's he, how does he figure this out? How does he, without an army, something he's good at, start to rise to power? So let's talk about how he does that. So... He begins talking, like I told you, and making speeches on the street. Just talking to anybody who will listen. At small gatherings, people, you know, while he's painting. And he just starts talking about how he hates Jewish people and how they are the reason for everything that is wrong in Germany right now. And they are the reason no one has jobs or no one has any money, etc. So they are the reason. They are the thing to hate. They are the thing to be against. So he begins to run for small offices. Now, the hardest part about this to remember when we're doing our research and we're doing our projects later on is that this is a long time span. It seems like when we do this, um, it happened overnight or it happened within a year or a couple years. So this is a long time. The time from World War I to World War II is a quite a bit of time. We're going to span basically 12 years of time throughout this project. So he begins slowly to run for small offices, you know, local ones, then a little bit bigger, more regional, and then bigger than that. So he starts to gain power slowly, but he does it very diplomatically and very strategically. So he tar starts talking on the streets about how everything's awful because of the Jewish people. They're to blame. They're the reason we don't have anything. They're hoarding it all. They are successful. We are not. They have the jobs. We don't, etc. He starts to organize his political party called the National Socialist German Workers Party. He also starts to... Uh, create these things like democracy, and he uses democracy to get gain his power. He starts talking about the sharing of wages, um, unions that we can all be a part of to help each other out and get jobs and money and resources. So he starts, again, gaining power, starts his own political party, and then continues along the way to talk about who to blame, who is to blame. And of course, we know at this point he's blaming the Jewish people. Eventually, uh, during this time, he uses his party and his... Um, his political offices to preach his beliefs about their enemies, the Jewish people. And during a speech in public, he lies about a, Jew, a local Jewish businessman. And when you publicly, sharing with other people, lie about somebody, something specific, uh, it's called libel. So he's sued for libel by that Jewish businessman, and he goes to jail because he was lying about him in public. So he's imprisoned, and like I said earlier, he writes his book, Mein Kampf. And like we know in a lot of situations, when somebody has a certain following and they go to jail or they're imprisoned or something negative happens to them, they usually return when they get out a martyr, which means they return as even more powerful or even more popular or more notorious. So he writes his book while he's in prison, and we know that he detailed everything he wanted to do in that book and is very honest about it. And he, when he comes out, he's a martyr. He has an even bigger following. So that didn't really do anything but increase his following, increase his supporters. 
So after that, after he returns from jail, after his release, he has regained his power of his party, the NSDAP. And he's elected, again, to a series of local political offices. So he's gaining growing support by using the Jewish people as a scapegoat. And when we say scapegoat, that means they're to blame for everything. Of course they weren't to blame for everything. There's no one group of people that is to blame for every single thing wrong with a country. But he kept using them as that. And when it's a bad time, 1930s, during the Great Depression, if you don't have a job, your family can't eat, you have no success, you're going to believe somebody that says, they're the reason, let's go figure this out, let's take them down, let's find a solution. So, <clears throat> in 1933, this is really the big part, again, 33, he was elected Chancellor of Germany, same thing as President of the United States. So he's used, again, elected means a democracy, right? We get to choose our leaders. So he's elected, uses this idea of democracy that we are used to, um, to gain his power. So, he says... Remember all those promises I made you, you know, about what we were going to do, about how to get rid of this group of people that's making everything awful for the rest of us? He says, oh, I can't do that with this kind of a government, this democracy, this uh, electing people into office and this and that and those things that are equal for them and not for us. So he's intelligent. He starts to say, oh, I can't do that with all of these stipulations, so we're going to have to change this. So basically what he does is he declares himself dictator of Germany and leader of the Nazi party and the Third Reich. So he changes this whole National Socialist uh, German Workers Party, this labor union, this democracy, and then he changes it to a dictatorship. If we know anything about a dictatorship, or if I asked you that word and right now we'd stop to discuss it, it means it's not usually a positive thing. It is an all-powerful person that doesn't have checks and balances like we know a democracy should. So he's pretty intelligent. He knows how to get what he knows he wants. He knew that he needed to use democracy to get where he wanted to go. Then, of course, when he is elected, elected being the key word, Chancellor of Germany, he declares himself dictator, all-powerful, no checks and balances, can make any decision he wants. So he changes this whole democracy party over here into this Nazi party, which obviously we've heard the word Nazi before, and we'll talk about that, and the Third Reich. So, moving to our next slide. What happens next after he's changed everything around, declares a dictatorship, no more democracy. He says, it's fine. I've got to do all these things for us. Here we go. So he turns Germany into a fascist state. Now, fascist means no individualism. It means the na nation's needs are more important than the individual's. You might have heard the word fascist before, but just don't know what it means. It does not mean that a, an individual is more important than the nation. The nation's needs more important than the individuals. So, another intelligent thing he did, he outlawed all other political parties and labor unions, those things that he used, and democracy, to gain his power to where he is now. So he knew exactly what he was doing this whole time. Now, did he know it was going to work? Who knows? Obviously it did. He knew exactly what he was doing step by step, what to say, who to say it to, how to be persuasive, how to appeal to people that, knew, that he knew needed uh, to hear what he was saying. So after he uses all those things to gain his power, he outlaws them. He takes control of the medias and the banks so that you only see what he wants you to see. He has control of all the money. He gets rid of democracy. He uses all these things to gain power and then outlaws them. Why does he do that? Okay. So he eliminated unemployment. He created public works projects that gives a lot of people uh, jobs. So if we do have some kind of public works project, like building a park, building trails, building railroads, building roads, that gives a lot of people a lot of jobs. He said, I'm going to bring you jobs, I'm going to bring you money. There you go. Okay, so then, people your age. So you are probably 13 or 14 years old. People your age and a little bit older were now, uh, it was mandatory for you to be in this youth service. Basically a little kind of tiny army. So you had to be in the youth service for Hitler. So after school, so we'd go to school, obviously we're not going to school now, but we'd be at school all day doing our usual thing. And then after school, instead of, you know, like basketball, baseball, music, another club, you'd go to this mandatory youth service. You'd go practice marching. You'd go practice strategy. Um, the girls would have to go learn about turning things into um, things that we would use for the war effort. So you'd learn how to uh, sew and cook and turn things into, not weaponry, but things that would be used in a war. And the rest of the world, remember, 
This is after World War I. It's not too far after that. It's about 15-ish years. The rest of the world, remember, had told Germany, you cannot have an army. You can not, um, you have to pay back all the things that you did wrong, although they can't because it's the uh, Great Depression. And so he's creating, interestingly enough, this really tiny little kid army. The rest of the world sees this and they're like, what? Why would we take you seriously? That's like a little kid army. You're 13, you're 14 years old. You're 12 years old. So he's pretty smart about this because in six years, how old are those, I mean, five years, how old are those 13 and 14 year olds going to be? Almost 20. That's a real army. So the rest of the world is like, what? what is this stupid kid army Hitler is creating? How is that going to help? So they don't say anything. Nobody, know, nobody really thinks that that's going to affect anybody. So next, again, I told you he's pretty strategic. He's pretty intelligent. We're halfway there. Okay. So he focuses his efforts, again, on controlling the youth, like I just told you, that youth army. Uh, he controls schools, organizations, and propaganda. So when I say the word propaganda, what I want you to kind of think of is the word brainwashing. So he is slowly and systemically brainwashing the youth. He starts telling them that they're the true Germans, that their parents, I'm talking, I'm going to talk to you as if I'm him, you know, you, your 13, your 14 year olds, you're the true Germans. Your parents are the ones that did everything wrong. They're the reason we're in this mess. They didn't know how to take care of things. You're going to change that. You are the ones that can do this. So that propaganda, that brainwashing, he only sees what you want, you only see what he wants you to see and hear and know and understand and he only get to learn what he wants you to learn. So you're starting to become brainwashed. You're starting to believe everything he's saying. He's very, he knows how to do this. He's very manipulative. He's very persuasive. He knows what to say to you. You're better than your parents. You can make the changes and you are only again taught or shown or seen what he wanted you to see and learn and hear. So he begins to create the SS, the German Security Police, and the Special State Police, the Gestapo. So one, the SS. Those are, those would be like regular street police, but they are given complete authority to do whatever they need to. Complete authority to use force, most specifically. They can punish, they can beat, they can kill, they can make people disappear. So though the SS, when we watch movie, well, if we get to watch a couple movies and when you read your books, you're going to see this idea of this SS group and although they are regular street police they are given complete authority to do whatever they want. So uh, some people would fight back to these um, SS if they were doing something wrong and again at this point nobody's being persecuted, nobody's being removed, taken away, but if you were doing something wrong uh, they you know if I talked out against Hitler or if I talked bad about you know something going on at school that was designed by him that would be when the SS would step in. Um, if I noticed suddenly that my neighbors had gone missing, it was probably because of the SS. So the Gestapo, they are the secret spies, and that's going to be important when we read um, Anne Frank. The Gestapo are the ones that, let's say I am a Jewish person, and my neighbors are non-Jewish, but we're both German. We're both from Germany. We both, uh, our families have lived here forever. We've been neighbors forever. But suddenly when Hitler has taken control and he's been in power for a couple of years, uh, he, again, he starts speaking out against Jewish people. Suddenly my, you know, my best friend next door, we can't go to the same school anymore. We can't shop at the same shops. I'm Jewish. She's not. Uh, we can't go to the same movie theaters. I'm not allowed over at her house anymore because her parents won't let me come over because I'm Jewish. And, you know, someone across the street may be a secret spy, a Gestapo. Uh, that would be why my friend is not my friend anymore. If that Gestapo saw her hanging out with me, or we went to the movies together, or I went over to hang out, that may not be a good thing to get back to the SS. So the Gestapo, again, could be completely normal people. They could be my neighbor across the street ratting me out to somebody if I was doing something wrong. So there's a big idea of fear and propaganda and brainwashing in this time period because we didn't know everything that was true, nor I didn't know if I could trust anybody around me. So this idea of trust and fear and ruling by fear was really powerful at this point. Okay, next slide. So here we go. This is a big one to remember. So Hitler decided he has a solution to the Jewish problem. <clears throat> this is when it really begins. Um, so when he starts really talking nationally, not locally while he was getting those little offices for um, pol political offices, but when he starts really speaking out publicly, nationally, about the his hatred and 
uh, disdain and the blame for the Jewish people, he starts these early um, efforts of isolation. So, again, he would say that he wants to get rid of the Jewish people. He wouldn't say, I want to kill them or I want to mass murder them. He'd say, I need to, we need to get rid of them. They're the reason of all of our problems, right? Okay. So it begins, and we'll see this a little bit in Anne Frank as well, it begins with this uh, registration, this required registration. Everybody has to have some kind of ID. Now, of course, when you grow up and you get um, a driver's license, that's your ID, right? Or a social security number. So everybody had to register, and there was nothing really going on yet, so we didn't think anything about it if we were Jewish, but we had to register, and we had to have an ID card, and it was public knowledge that we were Jewish. So it begins with this registration. Then it begins with, it continues with this isolation and this terrorizing of the Jewish people. So again, it begins with that isolation of registering, so it, it's public knowledge who is Jewish. Then we have to start wearing the Star of David on all of our clothing, our coats, our shirts, our bags. It has to be visible anytime we go out in public so that we can be identified immediately if we are Jewish. So we have that registration. That's easy. Someone can stop me along the street and say, excuse me, can I see your ID or your registration? They'd know I was Jewish. Now it's even easier to terrorize Jewish people and isolate them because we have the Star of David printed on us. So then this idea of expulsion from civil service, army, and schools. So again, like I said, if I was a Jewish person and my neighbor was not, and we both went to the same school because we live in the same neighborhood, I'm no longer allowed to go to that school with her. I have to go to a different school. I have to go to an only Jewish school. If I had a job, let's say my dad had a job down the street and he worked in the county building. He can't work there anymore. That's civil service. Let's say my cousin or my brother was in the army and he had a job there. They can't be a part of that either. So they were expelled, and that's what the word expulsion means, removed from all of those things. Again, isolating them. Um, our citizenship would be taken away, so we literally weren't a citizen of anywhere anymore. We weren't German anymore. So we don't have any more jobs. We aren't allowed to go to the same schools. Some smart Jewish people and Jewish families started to leave Germany. It was okay to do that at that point. There were no restrictions on that. So they started to go to neighboring countries. Um, some came to the United States. So some were able to get out. Some were a little bit more maybe in tune to what was happening or could guess maybe what was going to go wrong. So nothing was going wrong yet besides these things. And again, it was slow. It wasn't all at once. Um, but one interesting one to remember, and I always have you write this down, but it'll be in the notes the speaker notes down below, Einstein was actually one that left. Albert Einstein was one that got out of Germany. Now think about that. If Einstein hadn't have left, or his family wouldn't have left, we wouldn't have, probably wouldn't have Einstein. Albert Einstein would not have existed or gone on to discover the things he did. That's pretty crazy to think about. So, one last thing that started slowly, again, these didn't all happen at once, was that we were restricted in where we could live, and where we could shop. So there were places like, you know, I couldn't go to the same movie theater, but I couldn't shop at the same grocery store either. I couldn't live in the same neighborhood. I'd have to move out of my neighborhood and go to a very specific area just for Jewish people. Then, of course, you can imagine what happens when a whole country or a whole group of people are taught and required and told to start hating and isolating and terrorizing another group of people. If it's very obvious when I'm walking down the street because I've got a Star of David on me and I see another group walking down the other side of the street that are trained and taught and shown to hate me, it's probably not going to be a very good life for me. So this revolt resulted in growing violence. That group across the street would come over and beat me up because that's what they were told to do or shown to do. So there's this big idea that all of this is going on. He's the president, the chancellor of Germany right now. You'd think someone would speak out and say something. So he waited. He was smart enough to know somebody might say something. Somebody might see what's going on. So he waited for that public outrage and dissent in and out of Germany. And nothing happened. None came. Nobody spoke up. Now let's think about why. There's this idea of isolationism. The word isolationism. We know what the word isolation means. And us specifically, the United States, and a lot of the rest of the world was practicing that. It was, again, after World War I, we're all in a Great Depression. Nobody's doing great. The economy is awful. A lot of people don't have jobs. So think about when your life, if your life were to be very, very awful, if your family has no money, you don't have a house, you, don't, you can't get food, you're probably not worried about another country or helping out another group of people. 
you're already worried about yourself. You can't really worry about somebody else when you have to worry about your own issues when they're that big. So again, none came. Nobody spoke out. No public outrage, no dissent. Okay. This is where it really turns. So again, he tried to expel the Jews, which means get rid of them. He tried to get rid of them. He said to the rest of the world, hey, will you take these people? We don't want them. Of course, he didn't say it that way, uh, but he wrote letters and he requested other countries to take in the Jewish people. No country stepped up and said yes. Nobody said, yeah, we'll take them. No country said yes. So again, he was intelligent. He knew he had to take these steps. He knew he couldn't just start killing people and no one would notice. Again, the rest of the world is practicing isolationism. So again, he tried to expel them. He tried to literally get rid of them. That didn't work. So this idea of crystal knot, that's a German word. And when translated, it means night of broken glass. So November 9th, 1938, we're almost at the start of World War II. The night of broken glass. This is where it all begins. It's the true beginning of the extermination process. When you think of the word exterminate, it's not the same as the word expel. Expel is to get rid of. Exterminate is to kill, to get rid of by killing. So this is the beginning of the Holocaust. This is the beginning of mass murder on the biggest scale. So on this night, one night all across Germany, most Jewish synagogues, so Jewish churches or places of worship were burned, destroyed. Thousands of Jewish shops and homes were looted and destroyed. Again, burnt, broken glass. Thousand, a thousand Jewish people were murdered in the street that night. One night. 26,000, so 26 times the amount of the ones murdered, 26,000 were placed in concentration camps. Now this is probably the word, words, the phrase that you know most from the Holocaust. You know that word. You know the word concentration camps. So we're going to get into that a little bit. All right, since that's cut off. So this is how it begins. And this is our next step. Okay. <coughs> so Hitler decided to send all of the Jewish people to Poland, a very isolated country, very cold, very barren, very dense. And he decided to set up these things called ghettos. Now, I want, this is when I stop and I have you think about the word ghetto and what it means to us now. So if you, I mean, we, we have heard it or we've said it. Oh, that's so ghetto. So I don't, I want you to think about how that word is used now. And I want you to think about not using that word anymore. And here's why. The, re, the place it comes from, the history of it, is the Holocaust. Ghettos were designed for Jewish people to live in. And they were often enclosed by concrete, by walls, by barbed wire, and they were small, and they were dirty, and they were infested with diseases and sicknesses. It wasn't a nice place to be. So I know you know the word of ghetto describing something as awful or not great or, like, gross. Um, it, does, it really does mean those things. That is the connotation of it. But I want you to think about, before you use that word again, what that, what, why it comes from, where it comes from. So... <coughs> He designed these areas called ghettos. All the Jewish people had to move out of where they had lived, and they had to move into a ghetto. Now, if we had to move out of our house by force, obviously we're not getting to take all the things we want. We're not getting, you know, put it on the market and sell it and get money for it and move to somewhere new. It's just taken from us, and we're moved to this other place. So this is where I stop and I pause, and I want you to get a mental picture of what this is like, what a ghetto is like. So at this point in class, I have you close your eyes, put your head down, because I'm going to take you on a mental field trip. So we're going to start, and we're going to make it pretty similar to all of us. So we're going to start at Book Cliff, and we're going to take a very quick in our minds, but a very big mental field trip. So we're starting outside of Book Cliff. We're going to walk up to Orchard Avenue, and then we're going to walk down to 29th Street. So we're going to keep walking. And on the left, we're going to be passing Graff Dairy. And then on the right, we're finally passing Safeway. And we're going to get to Patterson or F Road. And we're going to turn right on that corner. So now we're walking past the other side of Safeway. And we keep going. And now we're passing Cross Orchards. We've gone a long ways. And now we're passing Grand Mesa. You can see Grand Mesa and Central on the right. 
And now we're continuing walking. Keep going, keep going, keep going. I believe we pass a Kentucky Fried Chicken and we get to the business loop. And I want you to turn right. So we're gonna make a big old rectangle. So now we're walking along the business loop. We're passing Starbucks and Qdoba and other city market, or sorry, the city market. And we continue going. You can see Central now from the other side. So we're passing Central. And then we turn off of the business loop onto North. And eventually we see Dairy Queen and La Milpa. And we continue going and we see the U-Haul. We see the Career Center. And then we finally get to the corner of 29. And we see uh, the new Taco Bell over on the left side, right? The new Taco Bell's there. But we turn right on 29 Road. And we walk all the way back to where we started on that corner of Orchard and 29. And we can go walk back right and get back to school. But I just made a big, so now open your eyes, I just made a big rest, er, rectangle. And I want you to think of that space from 29 Road all the way to Business Loop, from Patterson all the way to North. That's a big old rectangle right now. So that space, visualize that. Now I want you to think of Palisade, the edge of Palisade, all the way out to Mac or Loma. Now think of that huge space and all the people that live in between Palisade and Mac in this whole valley. Now every Jewish person that lives in this whole valley has to pick up and move into that one rectangle space that I just made. That's a lot of people in one area. So you can imagine what it's like when one that small space has to keep all those people. Now not every person living from Palisade to Mac is Jewish, but every Jewish person now from that area moves into that rectangle. That's the ghetto that they live in. So again, it was not sanitary. It wasn't super safe. Um, the things coming in and going out were restricted. We weren't allowed to leave and go out. Things were brought into us. It was not a great place. So that's why I want you to think about the word ghetto again before you use it in your own vocabulary. So now that I've showed you what it's like for the ghettos, we're going to start talking about how he starts to exterminate them. So he created concentration camps. When I'm living in this ghetto, you know, I'm being slowly starved to death because the food is being restricted that's coming in, the water is being contaminated. But Hitler realizes that's a really slow way to get rid of a group of people. They are not dying fast enough. He's trying to do this conspicuously, so it's not super obvious. So it takes way too long. It takes about nine months to starve someone slowly, where it's not super obvious. Um, it also takes a long time to introduce diseases into water. So what he starts doing is he creates these concentration camps. While you're in this ghetto, your dad, your mom, your brother, your cousin gets a call to order or a call-up notice that they have to meet at a certain place within the ghetto, and they're going to be taken away, they're going to go do a day's worth of work, and that's going to be how they get food and money to keep your family alive during this time. So they're called up to work, basically. Okay, so first things first. The first type of camp is a labor camp. A labor camp is what it sounds like. It's a place where you go to work. You make things for the war effort. So again, there's this idea in his head that I could starve them very slowly, and that's an easy and cheap way to kill people. So daily calorie intake at these places was 500 to 700 calories. That is what uh, they were allowed to have. To maintain body weight, basically just stay the same. Men need about 1,500 up minimum, and women need 13 to 1,500. Although you've probably seen on food that our daily intake is closer to 2,000 to 2,500, depending on what our body type is. Their daily intake was 500 to 700 calories. That's like a, basically a Snickers bar for the whole day. Okay. So first one, it's killed slowly, but you're also being used to make things for the war effort at a work camp. Obviously the other one is a death camp. A death camp is what it sounds like. It was a place to exterminate a group of people. So again, going through the process of how he exterminated Jewish people. So they would be called up to work, right, like I told you, and your job that day, let's say you'd be um, shipped out, not shipped out, but driven out, you'd be moved out to go dig a trench for laying railroad. So you dig your trench all day, they line everybody up at the end of the day to inspect your work, and you turn around, and they were, they shoot you, and you fall into the grave that you just dug yourself. 
So that was the first way that he figured out how to kill people more quickly than starving. However, that's too slow. It takes all day to dig a trench, and then we have the stench of dead bodies and we have to cover them up. So that's too costly and too slow. Again, the way I'm talking about this seems cavalier. I'm just expressing what, how it was done. This is reality and it's pretty crazy. So the second way, starvation. Again, in the ghettos, that's too slow. And at the work camps, it's still too slow. We have to get rid of those bodies. That's a lot. So the third way was carbon monoxide buses. So instead of going to dig your trench all day and taking all day, here's what would happen. You'd get your call-up notice. You'd go to the place where you're supposed to meet. You'd board the bus or the truck or whatever it was that you were to go, take you to go do what you were going to do that day. The driver would start driving a little ways, get out of the way of the ghetto, get out into the open, and the driver would stop, would close the door, go out and pretend to check something. The windows were blocked out so you couldn't see anything. Everything was locked. So the driver leaves, goes to the back of the bus, and flips a switch that was designed to, to put the carbon monoxide not outside, but back into the bus. So now you are carbon monoxide poisoned. It takes about, I think it, on average, it took like a whole day, not to obviously poison, but it took a while to poison and then you had to let it air out and then obviously the bus driver has to dispose of those bodies. So again, it was faster and easier and it didn't waste a bunch of bullets and things like that. But then again, you have all these bodies again that you have to bury or get rid of. So this leads to his best idea. And again, the way I'm saying this is just from his point of view, not from mine. His best idea was gas showers. So when you show up to a concentration camp on a train, that is basically when we're in the classroom, I describe the size of this train of about, so if you think about the back counter where the buckets are, where you get your binders, the length of that counter, and basically from the counter to the front board, so almost the whole classroom, but not quite. And about 100 people had to fit in that one boxcar to travel to the concentration camp. So when we get out of this uh, basically cattle car from the train, we've been on it for three days and three nights. So we don't feel great. Some of us got on and we were sick. And from that, we are told to go when we get off of the boxcar, left or right. Not why, no reasoning, but we're directed left or right. Now, if we were directed to the left, we were going to the gas showers. The gas showers killed millions of people. So again, this was his most efficient way. It took him a while to figure it out. So it took 3 to 15 minutes to kill someone. The poison that they used, that they figured out used, worked best, was called Zyklon B. Zyklon B, remember that. It was fast and it was painful. Now the three minutes would be closer to how long it took to kill a baby. And yes, babies were killed. That's probably the saddest thing about this. Fifteen minutes probably took a longer time to kill a very able-bodied individual. So the hardest thing to picture, and I always make you picture this, not because I want you to picture something sad, but because I want you to understand that if we don't speak up, things like this can happen because they have in the past. I'm not saying they will but we have to know history to avoid history. When they opened the doors to the gas showers, which were basically a big room with no windows, and it looked like there were a bunch of shower heads on the wall because they had to give the illusion that that's what was happening, there would be a mass pile of bodies. And if you had to guess who would be on the top of those, dead on the top, the people that were able-bodied, that it took 15 minutes to kill. I know that's hard to understand, and that's hard to see, and that's hard to hear. So again, let's move on a little bit. It was hard to dispose of all those bodies because those mass graves were too smelly, and they were too obvious, and it took all day. So they decided to burn bodies. And that's where we get the gas showers and the crematoriums. So the bodies after the gas showers were taken to the crematorium. And if you had to guess, who was, who was disposing of the bodies? Was it the Nazis that were working at this camp, or was it the Jewish people that were maintaining the camp? It was the Jewish people. So the people that had to move all the bodies of the Jewish people coming to the camp from the gas showers to the crematorium 
They lasted about six to nine weeks, and we can understand why. Their job was to move dead bodies and burn them. So by 1944, 10,000 Jewish people were gassed every single day. That's a lot to think about. It seems impossible. All right, this is the part. Usually I split this into three days. So that one day is just history and background, and the next gets a little bit more sad, and then we have only one day of sadness. But unfortunately, since we're doing this all in one, all the sadness has to come on one day. So, Auschwitz. This is Hitler's most prized possession. It's his largest and his most famous concentration camp. We'll learn about this. I will show you a pretty cool um, drone video going through the remains of Auschwitz. And it's, ooh, it's really eerie and it's kind of creepy, but it's cool to see. So Auschwitz was three camps in one. A lot of you are going to hear about the name Auschwitz in the Lit Circle books you choose. So it had three different camps. A political prisoner's camp one for a death camp, and one for a labor camp. So it's basically all three. Now the weird part is this political prisoners camp. So this was a war, obviously, and Hitler starts conquering a bunch of countries nearby, a lot of countries in Europe. So he obviously can't kill, he's smart enough to know he cannot kill famous political uh, officers or people in the armies that he's conquering. He can't just get rid of them. So he has a political prisoners camp. They're not killed, it's kind of a setup. It's what he shows people when they come visit. So it's a cover-up for the rest. Okay, so again, for the death camp, you are put on, and the work in the labor camp, sometimes they are two and one, you are put on that cattle car, that train, with a hundred people in a place that should probably only fit, you know, 20 cows. You're allowed two bags. You could bring two bags with you when you get your call-up notice. You're on that cattle car for three days, three nights. On average, 30 to 50 percent of the people in the cattle car died on the trip there. And again, when you arrive at the camp, you're grouped into those three camps at Auschwitz. At other camps, you're grouped into two. You're either grouped to the left or the right. And like I told you, when you get off, you're coming out of a dark cattle car, traveling for three days, three nights, no stopping. You don't get to get off and go to the bathroom. You probably smell bad. You're probably cramped. You might be sick. When you get off, immediately you're being sorted, left or right. So again, the people doing the work at these camps are Jewish people running, working the camp. The Nazis run the camp, but the Jewish people work it. So as soon as you're getting off, the Jewish people helping you that are working the camp, the Jewish people helping you off the train are whispering to you, volunteer, say you have a skill, say you can do something. Now, of course, we'd stop and talk about why they would do that. And the reason they would do that is because if you had a skill, sewing, blacksmithing, creating things for the war effort, obviously you were probably going to live. You were going to be grouped into the work camp, not the death camp. So people are whispering to you after you've been traveling for three days and three nights on this cattle car, say you have a skill, volunteer for something. So we'll get into kind of the nitty gritty of it. When you leave the train, when you get off the train, you are automatically being assigned if you are under 16, if you appear like you're under 16 or can't work, or over 40 or older, or like you are crippled, like you are sick, or mothers with small children, you are grouped to the left. And like I told you, left meant gas shower and it meant death. You didn't know that though. If you are not, you don't look like you are any of those things, you're grouped to the right. And that means you are going to the work camp. You are, look like you're able to work or you look like um, you are old enough to work, or you have a skill. So families, of course, are separated here. My mom that had a new baby, let's say my mom just had a new baby. She's going to go to the left. Let's say I look like I'm able-bodied and over 16. I'm going to the right. My mother and my sibling are going to die. I don't know that. But I'm going to the right to live, to work. So families are separated. Remember when they brought their bags and they had things that they were allowed to bring? Those are taken from them, and they are given to the war effort. Everything is taken from you. So again, we're grouped. One way is death, one way is work. We have no idea what these mean yet. So those selected to the right for labor camps, like I told you, some had to remove the bodies from the gas chambers. And like I said, those people didn't last very long. They'd die very, very quickly. They were underfed and they would go crazy. They had to remove bodies. 
from a gas chamber into a crematorium. Other jobs in the camp would be making stuff for the war effort, being a cook, being um, a cleaner, digging trenches, building weaponry. So again, if I go to the left, I'm going to die. If I go to the right, I'm going to work. Either way, once we are sorted, we all move our separate ways, go where we're supposed to be going, and immediately in line, we have to strip down. Those of us on the right get to go into the shower, and we actually take a shower. Our heads are shaved, and we are given a tattoo of a number. And we are now a number. We don't have a name. We have no more identification for anyone aside from ourselves or people around us that know us to know who we are. I am now a number. I am not a name. I am also, I have my head shaved. So when we have a bunch of people together whose identities have been stripped from them, it's almost as if they're not human anymore. So it's another way that Jewish people were targeted and made feel like they are not human and persecuted and discriminated against. So nearly the same thing happens on the left. We have to strip down. We wait to go into the shower, but instead of a shower, it's a gas chamber. The lights go out, the shower comes on, the Zyklon B is activated by steam, and slowly and painfully we die. So again, the two camps, the work camp and the labor camp, they are one and the same because to have a death camp, you have to have a labor camp for people to do those things. So again, this camp, Auschwitz, that was all three, worked around the clock averaging a killing of 3,400 Jewish people every 24 hours. So like I said toward the beginning, when this time span was pretty slow and long, it was the idea of concentration camps and killing 3,400 Jews every 24 hours for years and years didn't really happen. It took a while to build up to that. So remember that this isn't going on for 10 years, or this isn't the average for every day for 10 years, but it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Okay, we're getting close, I promise. Four more. Okay. All right, so, eventually, if you knew what happened in World War II, you knew the whole time that I was going through this, what was going to happen. Germany loses the World War II again. So, when the Allies, and the Allies are one part of the war and the Axis powers are the other. Axis power is Germany, led by Germany. Ally powers are led by the United States. When the Allies approached the good guys, I will say, the camps, the death camps and the labor camps, the camps were abandoned and destroyed because the Nazis were trying to cover up what they'd done. They were told to try to cover it up, destroy everything, burn it. The remaining prisoners, Jewish people, that were alive during this time, it would be too much to kill them all and leave mass graves, they were forced on what was called a death march back to Germany. So on this death march, obviously you can guess what it, why it was called that, most of them died. They were in not a good condition and it was a long time to walk, but they were forced to walk. So allies, the good guys, set up displaced person camps. Some stayed for more than four years. Some tried to go back to their homes, but they had already been taken. Like, if I had to move out of my home and into the ghetto, my home was not mine anymore. Other people were there. And others just moved away, moved to different countries. So when the war is starting to end, and it's becoming pretty clear that Germany is not going to win this war, that is what um, Hitler had instructed them to do. So toward the end of this war, it was starting to come out how many... Jewish, just how many Jewish people were killed and murdered. And this number, this 6 million, since then has gone up so much. We found out so much more. But two out of three Jewish people living in Europe during this time, two-thirds, were killed in the Holocaust. Babies, adults, kids. Two out of three. So if there were three Jewish people around me, two would be dead. One would have lived. He killed two out of three of all Jewish people. 11 million is really the big total. It's pretty crazy. Okay, so let's talk about how he started to lose. So, the fall of the Third Reich. So again, in his quest for ruling the world, he made a fatal mistake. This is how he loses. So I want to first to describe who the Axis powers are. The Axis powers are... Number one, Germany, Japan, and Italy. Russia is 
originally on the side of the Axis powers, Russia changes to the side of the Allies, and I'll explain why. The Allied powers are Great Britain, China, and the U.S. Again, Russia kind of switches sides a little bit, and I'll explain why. So the Axis powers we're going to think of as the bad guys. The Allies are going to, we're going to think of as the good guys, only for the sake of explaining things. So in his quest for power, he has this thing called hubris. Hubris is being so arrogant that you fail, knowing or thinking you are so good that you can't fail and then failing. That is what hubris is. So he makes a fatal mistake. So he is fighting currently. He's conquering all these countries around him. Austria, where he's from, so now he's technically German. Poland he has part of with Russia. He's conquering all these countries around him, just growing and growing and growing his reach and his power. And he tries to conquer Russia. Now this is a mistake. So in between Russia and Germany is Poland. Russia and Germany at the beginning of the war made a pact. They were on the same side and they said, hey, let's split, or let's split Poland. Obviously, Hitler used his side of Poland to put up all of, his, all of his concentration camps. Poland is a cold place, and so is Russia. So we are in the middle of a war, and he decides, even though he made this pact with Russia and they're on the same side, he says, you know what, I'm going to go conquer Russia. That's his fatal mistake. He's fighting a two-front war, which means he has troops in two different places doing two different things. They are exhausted. It is winter. He instructs the second front to go across Poland and conquer Russia. This is a mistake. It is winter. Russia is intelligent. <laughs> they know he's coming. So it doesn't work. They go through Poland in the winter, not a great idea, and try to conquer Russia. Again, he fails. It was an impossible task. So Russia, like I said, turns on Germany and say, well, what the heck? We made this pact and then you turned on us? Okay, we're not on the same side anymore. And then this is when the United States joins in. And the reason we join in, like I told you, we are practicing isolationism, a lot of you know this, um, is because of <coughs> D-Day and Pearl Harbor. We were attacked by Japan. We did not want to join this war because we were, in the, again, the middle of a um, the Great Depression. We were not doing great. And we did not want to be involved in another war where we felt like we would lose a bunch of money and lives and things like that. Again, we were attacked, then we joined. And at that point, this war had been going on for a while. So, continuing into how he eventually failed, his fatal mistake. So, again, we know that he knew that he was starting to lose. That's the biggest thing to remember. He knew he was going to lose this war. So... People around him started to realize that he was losing it, and they started to figure out that he was not going to win. There were multiple attempts on his life, both by his supporters and others. So many people had tried to assassinate him or kill him. So, at Valkyrie, when he was having this meeting with a bunch of his top supporters and the people on his side and his right-hand man and his advisors, they are sitting at a table in a meeting, about what to do next, because they all know they're going to lose. And they're sitting at a giant oak table, about four inches thick. It's a big, thick table. The guy on his right puts his briefcase underneath the table, and eventually throughout the meeting, he excuses himself to leave. In that briefcase was a bomb. And after he leaves, it goes off. So this person leaves that tries to assassinate him, one of his inner people. And he goes and reports to the news that that happened, that that was true. So it is reported and broadcast all over Germany that Hitler had died, that he, uh, his life had been taken. Uh, this was not true. The oak table was so thick, like I told you, it was about four inches thick, that the bomb was not powerful enough to injure or to kill him. It just injured him. So the uh, rest of the people around him, uh, they realized that we've got to get him out in the open. We've got to show the rest of the nation that he's not dead, he's alive. So they rush him to Berlin. He gives this great speech. You can see um, video of this. And you can notice in the video that his left arm kind of hangs down funny or looks like something's wrong with it. His left arm, or his right arm, uh, is what was injured. And his arm wasn't quite the same since then. He had been injured pretty badly. So, during this time, he had been given by his doctor something called a vitamin cocktail, which doesn't sound great. Uh, it was basically... A lot of morphine, which we know if you take too much, you become very dependent on it, and you, it is not, it's very addictive. And early 
versions of methamphetamines. So those two together don't sound like a great idea. So he was starting to lose it. He'd take this vitamin cocktail every day to take the pain away. And that was not probably the best idea. So people around him again are starting to realize that he's losing it. So he's starting to lose some of his supporters. So, all that to say, after that, they are losing. Berlin falls. They go into hiding. Okay. So after surviving that attempt on his life, again, he retreated into an underground bunker. The war is ending. He knows he's losing. He's instructed Nazis to destroy the camps, take the survivors on that death march, like I said. And he retreats into his underground bunker in Berlin to protect against air attacks. Everybody's joined in. It is a full-on war. It's been a full-on war, but it's an even bigger scale war, World War II at this point. And he knows he's going to lose. He knows Germany is going down again. So as Berlin falls, he gathered many of his local supporters, loyal supporters, together in the bunker, including his mistress. And this is the big one. This is another kind of crazy myth. They committed suicide. For a long time, the world thought that that was a hoax, that that was not true, and that he lived and that he escaped, and that he went down, you know, to Brazil or somewhere, and he's lived his life out, and obviously he'd be passed away at this point. So a lot of people didn't believe that, and they spent their lives searching for him. But I will tell you the truth. He did commit suicide. The accounts of suicide, how they committed suicide, varied differently. So all of his top officials uh, carried cyanide pills. So in case they were captured in war, they couldn't give away secrets. They couldn't be tortured for information. Cyanide pill, you bite into it, and it kills you. It's a poison. So all of his top officials were given those. So one account, one, one theory of how they committed suicide was that they took cyanide pills, that their, his officers uh, gave him a cyanide pill and her a cyanide pill to take to kill themselves. Another report was that he gave her, Ava Braun, the cyanide pill and then he shot himself. Whatever actually happened, they did kill themselves. The people around them then wrapped them in these big carpets or rugs that were down in his bunker and were instructed to take them out elsewhere to an undisclosed location and burn the bodies so that nobody could find them. So the world probably will never know what exactly happened, and that's why that drove so many people crazy. Um, but the bunker was destroyed as Allied forces started honing in on them, and the Nazis destroyed the bunker so that nothing could be found. And again, the Allied troops, the world, never found Hitler or Braun's remains. Their bodies were never found. So again, like I told you, there are theories that Hitler escaped and went into hiding, never to be found. The world never found him. That is not true. They committed suicide, and he died, because he knew he was losing. So the same thing kind of happened with Nazis. Obviously they didn't, maybe some did, for sure, uh, do the same thing. But the ones now responsible for this, obviously Hitler's gone, are the Nazis, the people he trained, and his loyal followers. So there was something called the Nuremberg Trials. After everything was done, after World War II was over, Germany lost, the Allies won, there was something called the Nuremberg Trials, where all the Nazis and top officials in his army were put on trial. Some tried to get away, some did, some did escape, some were gone and lived out lives, in tropical places and undisclosed areas. So some did escape, some lived their whole lives, and a lot did not, and were put on trial. Some died, some were found later, some were punished, most were imprisoned um, in, you know, the top highest security prisons, in sole confinement, no parole, or either put to death. Um, some are still alive today, and some were never caught, which is pretty crazy to think about. Um, some people spent their whole lives trying to find them. Most were found. But the Nuremberg Trials, and that'll be in the little notes down below, is something very, very interesting if um, you take that course throughout this project in quarter four. is something really, really interesting to learn about. So that's why that is in our notes down below, because it's something to come back to later. It's really, really intriguing. So all of this to say, the reason I give you this background information of how one person was able to and pulled off exterminating, killing, mass murdering 11 million people is because it seems impossible. 
Now, we've all heard of it, and we all probably have heard people mention one of those myths, or maybe believed one of those myths before. So the reason I share this is because this isn't the only time in history that mass murder or genocide, the killing off of a group of people, has happened. It has happened many places, maybe not to this scale, but throughout history of humankind, this is not the sole time this has happened. So the reason we learn about the Holocaust and kind of a morbid topic, again, like I've said many times, we have to learn about history so we don't repeat it. Uh, the last thing I usually have you write on your notes when we're doing this in person is one phrase. What you do matters. And that's what I want you to think about through all of this. What you do matters. What you don't do matters. What you say matters and what you don't say matters. Whether all those things are positive, negative, or a combination of both. Out of this unit, what I want you to get is a background of, unfortunately, how horrible humankind can be, but also how amazing humankind can be. I've told you the negative, sad parts of this, sorry, <laughs> but there's also so many positive and uplifting stories from this time that we'll also read, but I have to give you this sad, detailed account of what happened so that we can understand that there is this side of the coin, this negative, this awful, and then there's this other side. That one, it wasn't just negative and killing and there was also a positive side, we'll see, but also that we can help prevent those things. Like I told you, he was someone that was very intelligent, very smart, very manipulative, and there were people that stood up and spoke out, but not enough. So that's why we learn about this. And that's why the last thing I have you really remember about during these notes is that phrase, what you do matters. It'll guide the rest of our learning for all of this unit. So that was a lot, but that is our background information. And again, like I told you at the beginning, it's not nearly what I would want to do in three class periods, but it's a good base for now. I'll have a lot more to share with you, don't worry. So that's the end of this.